Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to Wolfson College tonight. Um, my name is Kevin Gregg. Um, I'm a junior research fellow here at Wolfson College, but I'm a departmental lecturer and course director in the School of Geography and the Environment, um, where I direct an MSc course on water science policy and management. Um, welcome um, to this evening um, about the ocean, no, or about oceans. Um, it is fascinating that water covers 71% of the Earth's surface and 96.5% of that is salt water. Uh, oceans are fascinating places. We love them for a lovely day uh, on a sunny beach. They're dangerous as well um, and they're mysterious. Mm -hmm. Just a couple of years ago, um, probably maybe I never paid attention in biology at school, but I've learned that... Uh, or I've learned about the dial vertical migration. I've never heard about this term before, but it seems fascinating. It is the Earth's largest biomass migration um, taking place in the ocean. So at sunset, zooplankton and others move up to the first 100, 200 meters below sea level, and at sunrise, they move down again. No? So as I said, this is the Earth's largest like, biomass uh, migration. Um, and this is apparently all about avoiding predators and accessing food. Um, so what we are going to do tonight is we're going to watch two movies, they're about half, half an hour each, um, and then we're going to have a panel discussion. Um, one of the panelists will join us remotely um, from Vienna in Austria, um, and um, I will properly introduce you to our two panelists after the movies, but um, for the time being, I'd like to introduce you to our guest tonight, which is Emma Critchley, um, an artist um, who uses a combination of photography, film, sound, and installation to continually explore the human relationship with underwater environment as a political, philosophical, and environmental space. Mm -hmm. She's a Royal College of Art alumni and has developed works funded by organizations including the National Media Museum, Arts Council England, the British Council, Singapore International Foundation, the British Academy, and the European Regional Development Fund. And her work has been shown extensively nationally and internationally in galleries and institutions, including the Australian Centre of Photography, the ICA Singapore, the National Portrait Gallery, the Royal Academy, and the, ba the Baltic Centre for Contemporary Art, and Tates and Ives. Mm -hmm. Um, before we start watching the movies, I'd like to hand the word uh, briefly to Emma to introduce us um, to the movies. Or you can, uh, or you come here. And then. Thank you for that. Um, so the two films that we're going to see tonight are um, Common Heritage and uh, another film called Witness. Um, Common Heritage um, was finished in 2019 and it began on a, a residency that I did, it was a year's research residency called Culture and Climate Change Future Scenarios um, and the idea was on that residency is we'd spend a year building a network with different climate researchers around the world um, and uh, develop um, some, well we didn't have to produce work, it was just a kind of research to, to then go forward and produce work after that. And this was one of the, the main topics that I was really interested in. And I wanted to make the film because 
there's this, it just feels that there's this huge um, rush, it's the new, the mineral rush of uh, rare earth minerals of the deep that feel, to me feels like he's going very much under the radar. So it, the film is like this urgent response to quite a critical moment that we're in at the moment. 2019 was, you know, it was at the time when the technology was basically there and uh, we were you know, it was kind of feels like things were really gaining momentum. Now it's even more um, prevalent because a two-year rule has been triggered uh, last summer, which means um, that next year, if uh, deep sea mining is is able to start, uh, and the the mining code has to be drawn, or some kind of mining code has to be drawn up. up um, by then. So the film is kind of asking us to, to look at our past. I worked a lot with archive material. It's to look at our past and reflect um, on the, the enormity of, of what it took to come up with the Common Heritage of Mankind Treaty and think about, you know, do we want to, how, how do we want to move forward into these frontiers, into, into the deep ocean? And using this um, moment to, yeah, to reflect on our past and think about how we might move forward um, and thinking about the geopolitical and environmental consequences. Witness, the second film, oh, um, was made um, during a residency I did with Science Gallery Venice um, called the Earth, Water, Sky Residency. And I worked with a project called the Ice Memory Project, who are, it's an international project that are collecting ice cores from non-polar regions around the world to, to create an archive um, in Antarctica. And the idea is a, a heritage project as opposed to a research project per se, um, in the sense that these uh, cores are being collected from glaciers that we're losing rapidly, and they contain vital uh, records of our climatic past, which help us um, think about how we might deal with the future. And so I work closely with a team of scientists there and, and around the world through the connections with um, the Ice Memory Project. Um, and the reason I, I kind of, or the, the moment I guess during the residency that I felt that I sort of found something that I really wanted to, to uh, respond to was the fact that um, actually glaci most glaciers around the world are, are now classified as dead. So once a glacier no longer accumulates enough mass to move down the mountain, it's classified as dead. And actually most glaciers around the world are in that state. Um, and I, so I started thinking about the, the body of a glacier, um, thinking about it as an animate body. So the film very much draws uh, this relationship. The, it's kind of posited around this idea um, of the ice core being like a post-mortem of a glacier. And it draws this relationship between the human body and the body of, of the, the glacier. Um, and uh, it, the research came from working with scientists, but I was also very interested in whose stories are being told through this analysis of the glaciers and by whom, and thinking about different ways of knowing, not only the, the scientific cerebral way of knowing, but knowing through uh, gla glacial retreat, on a living with glacial retreat on a daily basis. Um, so I can talk a bit more about how the film was made, but it's very much drawing from these different forms of knowledge, from not knowing through lived experience, knowing through scientific um, information as well. I think I'll leave it there. We can talk more after. Thank you. I hope you enjoy. Thank you, Emma. And then I suggest we start with the movies.
The funeral was held in late August. It was a small but significant gathering. Assembling at the foot of the mountain, the mourners slowly climbed, scattered across the landscape like a trail of ants. At the summit, a few words and a poem punctuated the silence. A memorial plaque was made. Words engraved on letter. Blessed, we forget. A concentration of lead was found in the layers. They said it is an indication of silver mining as it is used to concentrate the unearthed silver. Lead that is held between my fingertips, used to write these words. By analysing the lead's fingerprint, they traced its origin back to a mine in Bolivia, some 500 miles away. During the Spanish occupation, Cerro Lico, or which mountain as it became known, was taken from the Lakers. It became a site of the Spanish colonial mint and a major supplier of silver for the Spanish Empire. The town of Potosí became one of the wealthiest cities in the world. Thousands of indigenous people and African slaves were forced to work and live in the mines that pop up the mountain. Dust clouds of lead and vaporized mercury meant that many who worked and lived near the mine died due to lung disease and mercury poisoning, as an invisible toxic plague borne by the wind, suffered over the local area for centuries, seeping into clothing, skin, tissue, veins, water, soil, ground. Capital went into climate change. Lead latched onto small airborne particles that migrate towards the heaviness of the issue. Layers of history buried in the ground. Density. Intensity.
hundreds of thousands of years ago. She told me it's the same air we're breathing now. The same air, but different. When Europeans colonised the North Americas, the cause revealed a significant drop in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The conquest wiped out 90% of the indigenous population through disease, warfare, slavery and societal collapse. Much of the land was left devoid of people and swathes of agricultural space became populated by trees. Humans no longer breathing. Trees inhale and exhale. The same air, but different.
After the glacier disappears, everything changed for him. It's good for us at least to remember, he said, to have a special day. And that's why they had a memorial, a funeral. They wanted to say goodbye. We're sorry. We need you. We don't know what happened, but we don't see you anymore. So they don't have a hope that the ice will come back, she said. I think it's good to stay with the belief and the trust that something will come back. Maybe they'll do it here when the ice is gone. Anything that's existing must have a soul. So there must be a funeral, he said. As long as it's living, or it's breathing, or it has a soul, in my view, then it must pass, and therefore have a funeral. A subterranean city carved entirely out of snow, once preserved between thick layers of ice that guaranteed it never to be revealed. Military activity under the guise of science. 21 frozen tunnels housing 200 men, complete with a high street, cinema, chapel, skating ring, dorms and infirmary. It was from here they unearthed the very first call. In celebration, Pentagon officials drank cola chilled by ice when the time Christ was born. Ancient atmosphere dissolved into sweet, sticky bubbles of syrup as glasses chink. Air thick with the diluted water of words, sucking up oxygen, vaporing on. Unaware that one day, the ice that entombed their sewage, diesel and radioactive waste would in fact melt and leave their secrets bare.
and I'll find me, so I find out what to do, and shrink in the place of the As the tongue retreats, toxic insecticide from silent springs is remobilized by the earth. Pulses of pollutants deposited through atmosphere seep into alkaline water systems, infiltrating rivers, swelling into cups, pouring into mouths. This toxic fertilizer, once universally bound, is sunk into motion, delayed release, percolating, permeating, coming back to borders. I swim holding viruses, yet unencountered by humans, released their class. An archive is activated, animated. My close ones in dormant, reserved in the cryosphere, and woken from sleep lasting 15,000 years. Cause you expected, consulted, a flurry of study, predictions flow. At best, they said, diagnostic and informative weapons could be lost. At worst, they said, pathogens, disease producing organisms could be released, returned to circulation within the system.
the dark abyss was the womb of life. From here, life emerged. We still bear in our bodies, in our blood, in the salty bitterness of our tears, the marks of this remote past. Retracing this past, humans, the present dominator of the emerged earth, are now returning to the depths. Their penetration of the deep could mark the beginning of the end for their people, and indeed for life as we know it on this earth. It could also be a unique opportunity to lay solid foundations for a peaceful and increasingly prosperous future for all peoples. Mr. Merrow has attempted conservatively to calculate the reserves of metals in the manganese nodules of the Pacific Ocean. The nodules contain 43 billion tons of aluminium, equivalent to reserves for 20,000 years at the 1960 world rate of consumption, as compared to known land reserves for 100 years. 358 billion tons of manganese, equivalent to reserves for 400,000 years, as compared to known land reserves of only 100 years. Nearly 1 billion tons of zirconium, equivalent to reserves for 100,000 years, as compared to 100 years for land reserves, 150,000 years. 207 billion tons of iron, nearly 10 billion tons of titanium, 25 billion tons of magnesium, nearly 1 billion tons of lead, as compared to 500 years on land. Distinguished delegates, may I ask you to rise in your seats to observe a minute of silence for prayer or meditation. <coughs>
the hard realities of the formidable increase of the world's population provides us with the need to manage efficiently and equitably the immense resources of the sea. It embraces problems of political, economic, ecological, and technological character. And its successful conclusion would have a lasting impact on the future of mankind. We, in particular, believe that the common heritage principle should dominate our endeavors to make that principle a legal reality concerning the sea and its natural resources. Nobody has yet done this at a commercial scale. People have tested technology, but that is very different from operating at a full commercial scale. Countries like Tonga and Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, Fiji, where we've got licenses, you know, they have limited potential on land. So Seafloor Mining offers them the opportunity to uh, develop a solid mining industry which has a low environmental impact, but produces a high value. Is it important now? The answer to that question is yes, it is important now because multinationals are not going to wait to give time to look at all the studies, environmental analysis before they come in. They are pushing it. The mere fact that we know is that it's going to touch into the garden that we have been using for the rest of our life since immaterial time. People are, are afraid of the dark. It's a case of, um, in the absence of knowledge, their default reaction is to be conservative and worried. And so what we've got to do is shine light into those dark corners and explain what we're doing and show that there is nothing to fear when you switch the light on. This is water we're talking about. This is not a brick wall. It doesn't stay in one place. This is water. So if you dig at the bottom, obviously you're going to create dust and that dust is going to be spread over by the current. And it's going to go away. We don't want to be a testing ground. We don't want our environment damage. And we will provide alternatives for our people. Why are we trying to mine everything out in one go? What will happen to the next generation? What happened to our grandchildren? Where are they going to get things? Between the very few dominant powers, suspicions and tensions would reach unprecedented levels. 
traditional activities on the high seas would be curtailed, and at the same time, the world would face the growing danger of permanent damage to the marine environment through radioactive and other pollution. The process has already started and will lead to a competitive scramble for sovereign rights over the land underlying the world's seas and oceans, surpassing in magnitude and in its implication last century's colonial scramble for territory. is the dramatic revelation of the wealth which lies on and beneath the sea. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to open the first meeting of the Third United Nations Conference on the law of the sea. It's essential to emphasize that this conference will proceed on the basis of General Assembly Resolution 2749, namely that the seabed beyond national jurisdiction is the common heritage of all mankind. For the first time in history, the representatives of states will be engaged in translating this vital concept into reality. That the seabed beyond national jurisdiction and its resources are the common heritage of mankind. A new to create a strong seabed regime would almost certainly lead to preemption of the lion's share of the benefits by those with the capital and technology required. I'm sorry to interrupt the uh, uh, chairman of the second committee, but may I appeal to the delegations to, uh, in the wings not to make so much noise. They should have learned by now that they must extend some courtesy to the speaker. Technologically advanced countries want complete freedom of research. I think it would be undesirable for any delegation to absent itself. Distinguished delegates, this session is going to be, as I stated earlier at the meeting of the General Committee this morning, not merely a crucial session, but a critical one. I use this word with great care because I am convinced that unless we make sufficient progress during this session either to arrive at agreement on a treaty which is generally acceptable, we would have lost one of the greatest opportunities that have ever been placed before us.
asked not to abstain but to vote against the treaty. Why was that? <clears throat> well, obviously, uh, we have worked uh, very uh, closely uh, with uh, our principal major uh, industrial allies. Uh, and uh, we were concerned uh, that uh, uh, a, a continuing uh, unified uh, position uh, be taken, if at all possible. Uh, it is correct such uh, approaches were made. The, there is, uh, is no question uh, of mining at the, uh, at the present time. Uh, I, no company or no consortia uh, intends to mine immediately and would not do so until such time as it becomes economically viable uh, to do so. Uh, there, of course, uh, uh, is nothing uh, that uh, would prevent a company uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, uh, from doing that at, uh, uh, at such time as it was uh, prepared to undertake that, if it could get the financial backing to do so. Let's assume that they then proceed to mine the seabed under the mini treaty. I want to tell you, and through you, I want to tell them that I will take it upon myself to persuade the United Nations General Assembly <coughs> to adopt a decision asking the International Court of Justice for an advisory opinion on whether such activities under unilateral national legislation are lawful or are they illegal. And if the court's opinion, of course we don't know how the court will rule, if the court's opinion is that such activities under the Mini Treaty are illegal. I would like to see whether these Western countries, which have been sermonizing to the third world about the rule of law, will ask their consortia to stop such activities, or whether they will review themselves to be a bunch of greedy Well, I wish you all a good weekend. Thank you very much. Sea Treaty, I think, is the greatest single raid on our sovereignty in, in my lifetime, anyway. And yeah, they would be able to do it. This, this new group that's called the uh, International Seabed Authority would have the authority to level taxes on everybody, us and other countries. Now, I'll tell you what I think. Uh, and, you know, and when you talk about a regime of management on the high seas, how would you police the regime that is so vast?
was the head of the sea and ocean affairs section and we worked for 20 years in the law of the sea conference we discussed at that time scientific research the importance of high seas pollution in ocean in the oceans so what has changed since those years apart from climate change Thank you very much um, for these stimulating and fascinating movies. I think so many themes that we can unpack um, resulting, from <coughs> excuse me, resulting from these movies. But first of all, um, we are now joined by a guest um, online. Um, and I would like uh, to introduce you, first of all, 
um, to uh, Michaela Dave, who's joining us, as I mentioned earlier, from Vienna in Austria. Um, she is the ocean law and policy analyst, legal researcher at the uh, Thyssen uh, Bornemisza uh, Academy 21. Um, if you ever find yourself in Spain's, in Spain's capital, Madrid, there's a wonderful um, museum. Um, and in concert with the Academy's mission to catalyze action and care for the ocean, she's mapping deep sea mining developments from a nuanced and transdisciplinary framework at the intersection of art, law, and science. And she's also a doctoral researcher at the University of Applied Arts uh, in Vienna for legal rights representation from visual cues of political and activist art on the issue of ecology, gender, and migration. And then um, we will also be joined on the panel by um, Professor James Crabb. Uh, he is a supernumerary fellow here at Wolfson uh, College and a former governing body fellow uh, and wine steward uh, <laughs> um, at Wolfson College. Um, an emeritus professor, he was formerly professor of protein biochemistry and head of school at the University of Reading, an executive dean and of creative arts, technologies and science uh, and professor of biochemistry at the University of Bedfordshire. Um, I think, um, or as a fellow and former vice president and council member of the Institute of Marine Engineering, Science and Technology, much of his recent research uh, is in the maritime environment uh, area and notably coral reefs and climate change. Um, there are many achievements. Um, I would just like to point out one of them um, because it's the most recent one uh, and James and his work received the just recently uh, a grand prize award from the IUCN which is the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Um, and since this is an evening about the ocean um, I shall also mention that he is a scuba diver, assistant instructor, and master scuba diver. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, James, Emma, may I invite you um, to the stage? And just to check, Michaela, you can hear us? Yeah, perfect, wonderful. Um, <laughs> okay, um, before I turn to Michaela and to James, Emma, I'd like to ask you again um, about the movies and maybe tell us a little bit more about how did you make the movies? Oh, sorry. Yeah, this should actually... I'm awfully sorry. This should actually... Yeah, this is better now. Yeah. Um, so am I just to repeat my question? Um, just, just that we've now finished watching the movies, um, I would be interested in how did you make the films? Any challenges you, you faced uh, making these movies? Um, yeah, so can you hear me okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I st I, to start with Common Heritage, because that's the one uh, you've just seen, um, like I said, it was, uh, there was a lot of research, there was years of research that um, went into the, the film before making it, really, um, and I guess one of the challenges was getting my head around um, the, the unclossed, the, the kind of nine, ten, well, more than that in the, in the end, uh, years of what, what happened in all of the conferences that, that built up to coming up with the Common Heritage of Mankind Treaty. And my studio wall became a bit like a, a murder case where I was kind of piecing together um, all of the speeches and, and uh, the archive material that I'd kind of found to kind of get my head around how it, how it all kind of tied together and, and then what that meant, you know, to us today. Um, and so I, I worked with the um, National Oceanography Centre in Southampton and they, they um, used their deep sea archive footage, which is what you, you see, saw of the deep. Um, and so, yeah, archive material was, was very much um, ha how I made that film and kind of comparing the kind of um, these deep abyssal landscapes with the, with the conversation. And I specifically wanted to kind of draw on science fiction. The, the speech that I found... Up, 
Arvid Pardo's speech um, was what really triggered a lot, um, you know, triggered the kind of making of the film because it's this incredibly evocative speech uh, that sounds like, I think, that, you know, um, that it could be the beginning of a science fiction film. So um, in the film it's narrated by Gwyneth Jones, who is a science fiction writer. Um, so the film starts um, with, with his speech and it's, it's really this warning to us about, you know, we've got these riches of the deep and off the back of the Second World War at the time, you know, the, the, the discovery of these riches could make us or they could completely uh, break us. And so, um, yeah, it, I, when I worked with the uh, archive in Southampton, it was wanting to find footage. What it became really fascinated with is how much it kind of looked like, you know, a, another world, another planet. And so I kind of, yeah, worked with, with their material um, and the, the International Seabed Authority material. And then, um, and then the divers that you see in the film, they were, I, I shot those. Um, and they, they, I guess with, the, with that material, the water is kind of uh, offers a, a, um, a psychological space and it's, it's kind of chance for us to kind of reflect on all the proceedings that are happening in the film. And also the divers are very much kitting up, they're going down. So it's like this idea of um, the momentum that we are going to go there, we are going to, to mine these places, we are already in these spaces. But um, the question is how we might go in there, how, how we might... Um, uh, enter those spaces and the consequences of those. So they kind of, I guess, are, are a moment of, of reflection, but also um, showing the inevitability of the, of the situation. So, um, yeah, and I guess, again, with the science fiction, it's, it's very much thinking about the fantasies that we build around these um, distant places and the problem with that and the problem of thinking of, about them as re remote and other. And actually, they're not. They're very much... Part of our of our world, and we need to to think about them in in that way. So that so that was again why I wanted to to draw from the science fiction tropes is in in um, creating this familiar world, this familiar science fiction film that you feel kind of comfortable with, and then this then it's kind of the idea is that it's making us think about the, the problems with that with, with the fantasy that we build around these places. Um, and then yeah, witness was made. Um, like I said, during, during a, a residency that I did um, with uh, the Science Gallery Venice, and that was, it was really important, the process was really important um, in making that work. Um, I really wanted, like I was saying before, I, I was, became very interested in, in whose stories are being told uh, and by whom in terms of the research that's been, um, the narratives that have been drawn out of the ice. And so I wanted it to be more a collaborative uh, response to, to the research. So um, we, I kind of took, I found sort of bits of research that particularly interested me. And uh, I did workshops with people. So we did workshops at Kafoskari University about, um, that were narrative workshops. So we used the scientific research and created stories around that research from different perspectives. So it's the idea that as humans, we're storytellers and we make meaning about information through storytelling. That's how we pass on information. It's also how we embody uh, a situation or, or a narrative and, and kind of make sense of it. And then I also work with the dancers um, who, who you see in the film. Um, and again, we, we did workshops and we used some particular um, papers uh, that had sort of narratives to them and then um, worked with movement um, responding to those papers. So it's like, yeah, collecting kind of different people's responses to, to the papers was, was really important. And then the workshops were also... Um, like from the workshops, we selected two dancers, and they'd never worked underwater before. Um, so we then did uh, auditions underwater, and uh, they were given free dive training. And uh, then we developed. We spent a week uh, developing the movement underwater before going back and spending a week filming. And then I also uh, remotely interviewed people uh, in Peru and Kenya who were living with Glacier Retreat. And those stories are, are also woven into the script as well. So it's that idea of, of knowing through lived experience and, um, yeah, and wanting to very, very much um, wanting to bring those narratives, those stories into the, to the film. Thank you very much, Emma. I'm going to move here because I think um, Nicola can hear me better when I'm standing here. So, picking up on this. <laughs> and 
um, based on your background um, and, and research, which is like on the policy and, and the legal side. So what makes the ocean such an interesting place from this perspective? Yeah, thank you so much, Kevin, um, for having me here. And a big hello to the audience as well as our panelists. Um, I heard Emma, but not 100% um, because of the sound discrepancies. And, um, forgive me if I miss out on something, but I'd like to answer your question. So as Kevin, you said in the beginning, um, when you were introducing us all that the oceans are a vast space that is all source of life. And we know so little about the mysterious remote and vast space that occupy as 71% of a planet, right? And this is true, especially in the case of the deep seabed flow, as shown in Emma's films, um, especially Common Heritage, the second the one that we saw together, a um, large part of the seabed floor has a rich ecosystem, as was shown in the film. Scientific evidence point to fascinating sea creatures and rare minerals that can be used um, as alternatives to fossil fuels for a green revolution. So the deep seabed floor with these uh, mineral deposits fall under international waters which prompts the environmental principle um, called common heritage of humankind, which is what um, Emma's um, film is titled after. And this is part of the um, UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. So the film traces this principle and prompts us to think of our oceans as our common heritage, our space to govern and manage the deep uh, sea resources. And this is the part that is contested even today from the time um, of the 1970s that the film really well portrays, as well as now that we are in 2022, that deep sea mining may happen anytime it can become a reality because it is still being pushed off state and extractive industries. So this momentum has the potential for deep sea policies to be framed in two years um, timeline. Uh, so Emma talked really briefly about the two-year trigger rule. And in this two-year trigger rule is that um, um, a particular small Pacific island um, called a uh, country called Nauru, um, they triggered a two-year rule, which is part of the UN Convention Law of the Sea. Um, it basically um, asks a UN um, body, which is called the International Seabed Authority, to frame a mining code within two years. So this was activated last year, which means um, we will see a mining code next year. So um, there is a certain urgency um, to deep sea mining um, at the moment um, as per this uh, two year trigger rule. And it is actually um, the states that are driving this um, um, deep sea mining um, urgently, as well as uh, along with extractive industries. And interesting, interestingly, there's also a little bit of politics at play here among developed states that have the technological meal, uh, meal, uh, means and um, financial uh, means as well to um, go further um, towards um, um, wanting uh, or like desire, desiring uh, deep sea mining. Um, and uh, the politics in the South Pacific Islands are a little bit different where there's um, small Pacific Island countries that want deep sea mining. There are some others that do not want it. So there's a lot of political strife within their indigenous communities as well um, that we see. Um, so we have to um, therefore consider laws and policies um, from this political field of um, what to do the indigenous communities want because um, their ways of looking and uh, thinking of the oceans from their ancestral times, as well as their um, seafaring ways, is so much important um, to consider in terms of framing our laws and policies, and not the way in which it is framed at the moment, which is being pushed by developed um, states and extractive industries and some small Pacific Island countries. So this is the space where I think um, in terms of the art space and also some institutional spaces that are of academic nature that artists can enter in this realm, unmask these uh, complex issues and tackle it with imagination and film narratives so that we as 
stakeholders, we being the public as stakeholders, can take stock of the oceans and try to think of oceans and policies a certain way, which we have a right to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, let's hear another different perspective, James. Um, can you tell us like what what is so fascinating about marine environments and what attracted you to do research into marine environments and why is it so important? Thank you very much. Can you hear me? No. <laughs> Can you hear me now? <laughs> Great. <laughs> Better. Okay. Um, so I started off doing biochemistry, but I very soon realized that it was very important to gain information from many different areas in order to solve particular problems. And uh, at the time, I'd just become uh, a scuba diver, and uh, a colleague of mine was very interested. He was a marine biologist, and he knew that I did a lot of computational biology. So he um, tried to persuade me that uh, there's quite a lot under the ocean uh, that is worth looking at. And indeed, I did and I spent quite a lot of years um, working in Indonesia and in the Caribbean, uh, particularly in Jamaica, on the reefs of jo Jamaica. Um, and it, it, it's clear that one of the things that, that you tried to bring out in the film, I think, was the, the fact that people think of it as very distant mm. under the ocean, and yet it is just you know, within reach, particularly in this country. We are a maritime nation. We're no further than 60 miles from, from the ocean. Um, and yet it, it, it's very important of our, for our common heritage in this country. And yet maritime industries are really not considered in these, these times very, very much. The interesting thing about deep sea mining is that it's very much on the yin and yang of environmental uh, possibilities. Because on the one hand, we all use technology. Technology is extremely important. Uh, we know that wind farms uh, are very important uh, in changing from uh, coal-based energy to a more environmentally friendly energy. And yet so many of the materials that are used uh, in these high technology, modern, um, ecologically friendly systems are themselves uh, fraught with difficulties. We saw the manganese nodules in, in your film beautifully, I think, and that, that very scary thing that was, that was coming over. You know, uh, um, it's, it's very difficult because if you bind these, uh, these, these important nodules, um, you just don't know what is under there. We had a lovely uh, octopus, a Numbo octopus. That was, that was brilliant, just to, over the manganese nodule. That was a great shot. Um, but that's only one thing. Uh, deep sea mining means a tremendous amount. It's anything below 200 meters, you know, right down to the abyssal levels where you get, and I'm sure you've seen them on the TV, those sort of sulfurous fumes, those black smokers, uh, which are based on sulfur. The life forms there are based on, on sulfur. So it covers you know, an enormous amount of, of the planet uh, that we just don't know about. I mean, we only discovered those, those black smokers uh, 10 years or so ago. You know, how much more is there to, to discover? And, and the big issue is that this, uh, these important ecosystems are so vital for our planet uh, that we don't know what's there. And yet we are, because of greed, let's face it, it's greed, um, are trying to develop these, these, uh, these methods um, which are ecologically themselves very unfriendly. So it's an extremely complex process, and that's why it needs the, all the, the, the different elements to come together. It needs the science, it needs the ecology, it needs the, uh, the marine biology, um, it needs the law, 
very much it needs the, the mm. law, it needs, it needs policy makers, and it needs artists. You know, it needs all these elements to come together so that we can make some sort of common heritage decision. Will we do it? Will there be that global governance which, which allows us to, to make that? I don't see it at the moment. There are, there are possible avenues, but it, it's just not being there. Okay. Thank you, James. Um, before we continue with the panel, I was wondering if there are any questions or comments from the audience. Uh, we have if there are countries where all everything you said is true we have the regulations, everything. But I think it's still something to do with people attitude. This is where we have to work on education from early ages, I think. So I don't know, that is a kind of subtle um, action which should be there all the time. Thank you. Yes, and that's where the art com comes in, to, to, to train, change people's perceptions. I mean, that's why art is, is so, so important. Is there anyone else who wishes to comment or to answer, to, answer, to ask a question? But also, it, it, while you're thinking of a question, also it's the education. I mean, to answer your, your, your very important point, you know, it's about how pe people think, their perceptions, their, their belief systems, if you like. That's why education at the earliest level, at the earliest stage, is so, so important. You know, it's, it's, it's before the primary schools that, that are all those, those genes, all those nerve systems, all those elements, those complexities are put in place. Uh, and you know, that, that lasts for one's whole lifetime. There are modifications. Our students, our students, other students also. It's okay. so, Sorry, I didn't. I said our own students also yes. should be educated from that point of view. Yeah. I mean, we do our lesson and then at the end we tell them something about this. Um, I'm a little bit, uh, I don't know, I'm subjective maybe because I just, uh, I do Byzantine studies, but I publish um, an article about how Byzantine treated the environment uh, and Plato also because it's what I, is my specialization and it was the university gave me a, an award for that. So, um, it is possible to do this in any subject you teach. You can insert something about yes, environment. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Whether you're a classicist or, or yeah. a historian or a geographer or a linguist, of course you can, and that's so, so important. Yeah. Absolutely. And then I saw the impact the, immediately. I mean, the, the faculty, my faculty start putting advertisement or flyers about the environment, everything, so it works quite, um, it's quite efficient what you can do. It is, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank okay. you very much to all of you. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you for the uh, movies, really, and uh, I'm a biologist and I also come from an island, so the sea has always been like a big part of my life as a source of inspiration and mental support, I guess. And my comment uh, would be that I can see that even though we talk about marine sciences and we talk about the oceans, we treat it as something that is very far away. Uh, and even in our, in our coastal cities, we build large ports. We don't have access to the sea as we used to do before. We see the sea through industries, through big ports, instead of 
an access and as a pe as a source of peace of mind. So I was also thinking that this is important not to not only to focus on what uh, what is happening at the bottom of the oceans, but also how can we, in our everyday lives, uh, restore the relationship we have with the sea. Yeah, I mean, that's something that um, I think about a lot. Like, how, how can we care? How can we connect with, with the ocean? It's something that McCullough and I, I, I should say really, that we, we're developing common heritage in, in light of the two year rule being triggered. Makara and I are working to develop the work that we're, the, the common heritage work. And something that we talk about quite a lot, isn't it, is how, how can we connect? How can people care? Um, and, and, you know, and then which what develop stewardship and ownership, you know, feeling ownership of the ocean. And it, it's, it's really difficult. And I think that, um, you know, we're not all lucky enough to be able to dive and, and, and swim. I think you know, one, this simple thing about this idea of internet, interconnectivity, which I more thought about with witnesses, you know, like in terms of the air that we breathe, the circulations of the earth, we are, you know, we are breathing and um, exchanging air and water, you know, the water droplets in the air, is all, it is all part of this, you know, environment that we inhabit. So we are actually a lot more connected than we, we think. Um, but also I think, you know, what, like you were saying before, that's a lot why art can be or where art can be really uh, effective or really important because it um, it's not just about kind of uh, information it's it's about emotion and I think that's a, a kind of way I feel that you know that, that people can feel a connection because there's there's obviously very complex issues and problems but actually emotion is a really core is really important in in dealing with or, or understanding important like complexity I guess is, is through emotion and, and very sensitive and nuanced um, problems can be, you know, it's, it's sometimes you can't put words to them, but you can like feel uh, why, feel a connection or feel a relationship. So hopefully that's where art can, can ha have a role um, or play a role. And, and also it's, it's, it's good at um, interdisciplinary, bringing, you know, different disciplines together, which I, definitely feel is, is really important in terms of how we might move forward with the, with dealing with the environmental situation. But also, you know, with the, with the oceans, it's thinking about it from different perspectives uh, and bringing different disciplines together. I, I thought your, your point was a very good one about living on an island and, that, and yet you see it through industry. When I've worked in Jamaica, um, a lot of, in fact, the, the main... Uh, income from Jamaica comes uh, from bauxite and you have bauxite mining on the island and a lot of the industry of then you have the shipping coming in and taking the bauxite away. So there's, there's very little for the Jamaicans to do to actually get into the ocean. It's seen as a vehicle not as a place, not as an environment, not as an ecosystem. And also, it's getting over fear. You know, there's a lot of fear about the marine environment uh, that we have to overcome. And I think, you know, your point about, about education and, and, and whether you're a, a classicist or whatever, you can bring things in to, 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 to show people that they don't need to fear the marine environment. It's something to be embraced. It's where we came from. After all, we were all, that's, that's the source of our life. Um, so it's not to be feared. It's something that we can embrace and feel it's part of us. Absolutely, yeah. Perhaps, can I ask a, a question? Um, I'm, I'm quite struck by, by, by what I've seen here. And I've been working with the environment all my life and um, I know that all the difficulties we have to control the climate problems are in spite of a lot of publicity and what you've just described tonight is so serious and very few people know about this. So my question is actually how distant are we from reaching an international governance that can actually control this common environment and, and protect it against these interests that are 
uh, spread all over the world in, in different places, different uh, governances. Perhaps that's a good question from Makala. Um, it, it, I didn't hear the question very clearly, so if Kevin or someone who's closer to me can um, just repeat it, that's all right. Um, sorry. <laughs> So thank you, Michaela. Uh, the, quickly, the question is about uh, global governance to deal mm -hmm. with, uh, with the problem of the oceans, that we are, if we think of climate change, there, there is a lot of awareness everywhere, and still it's so hard to reach global governance to, to, to control the problem. How distant are we from reaching this relative to the oceans? Thank you for the question. I'll try my best to answer, but also I'm thinking with you as well, because um, as um, Emma and Professor Fab have already uh, put forth this, like how we need to think about the oceans and it should start with um, thinking with the oceans, you know, to be able to actually think of um, the way in which narratives are being played out at the moment um, on world stage especially um, something that's on my mind and I'm sure it's on everyone's mind is that um, this Ukraine crisis yesterday. I think there was a question that was asked in the context, who gets to make history? Who decides history and which side of history are we on? So I think these are fundamental questions to ask in the context of um, ecology and climate crisis and also deep sea mining. Um, is that what do we want for our planet and how do we think um, with the oceans um, as one entity, um, as, as being wholesome and as well as uh, to be able to use artistic and non-Western perspectives um, in sense of indigenous ways of uh, thinking with the oceans and also their lens to actually think about preserving our oceans together. And I think this has to be more stronger from our front in order to shape some narratives for international um, players who are already deciding the fate of our oceans, especially with deep sea mining, um, because the International Seabed Authority, for instance, which is sitting in Jamaica and they are a UN autonomous body, they, uh, they, they give permits to um, states and extractive industries that want to deep sea mine. At some point, they frame, for example, the deep sea as a global public good. So this is a narrative that they are going with in order to um, have their own self-interest, but also at the same time to be able to give out these uh, deep sea mining um, permits, because that is essentially what they do. And this is where I think it's important to challenge this narrative um, in the way that we can, um, you know, um, start thinking differently and collectively, and to be able to shift it um, to our uh, to our side in order to preserve the oceans. I, I hope that um, this is a satisfying answer. But I'd love to also um, ask you uh, as well what you think of your own question because um, it's it's a really good question that you asked. just want to thank you. Uh, I think it was a very good answer. It's a difficult question, perhaps one we are distant from being able to really offer a solution, but thank you very much. Are there any further questions? If not, then um, I'd like to thank everyone, um, especially Michaela, um, for joining us uh, tonight, uh, James, uh, and of course, uh, Emma. Um, um, maybe I should um, note that Witness, so the first uh, film uh, we watched, will have its full uh, UK premiere at the Brighton Festival uh, later this year in May. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I hope you join me in thanking everyone on this panel again and uh, I wish you a safe trip home.
Um, and thank you again for coming.